They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends. U.S. Battleship Alabama. British cruiser Belfast. And Polish destroyer Błyskawica. These ships are very different, but they all have one thing in common. The Bofors L-60, one of the best automatic anti-aircraft guns of World War II. It is estimated that this model of 40mm automatic cannon shot down more airplanes than all other anti-aircraft guns put together. Caliber 40mm, barrel weight 103 kilograms, barrel length 56 calibers 2,250mm, loading principle clips 4 shots each, rate of fire 120 rounds per minute. Shell type, primarily fragmentation. Shell weight, around 900 grams. Maximum vertical range, 7,160 meters. Guns were installed in single, coaxial, quadruple, and six-barreled mounts. She became a very efficient gun for anti-aircraft and surface targets. As uh, time progressed, the, uh, the, the first of the um, Bofors that came online with the Royal Navy were hand-driven uh, in terms of elevation and training. And uh, they were, had a very basic sight system. And um, again, like a lot of uh, early systems, they were reliant on training, uh, ability of the aimers and, and the gun crew. The specifics of World War II artillery relies on the fact that the smaller the caliber is, the more it depends on the gun crew, on their cohesion in combat. The performance characteristics of light guns, anti-aircraft guns, and Bofors in particular, are a combination of the artillery mount itself and the training and coordination of its crew. Especially in battle, when tensions are running very high, there's no time to think, and you need to move very fast, turn around, load new shells, and start firing. And all this happens automatically, without thinking. After a battle, sailors often couldn't even remember what they were doing. Battle level of performance was achieved through constant training. This weapon is operated by a crew of four. Three on the mounting, the gun layer, the gun trainer, the loader, the fourth member, carries the ammunition from the magazine and loads them into the clips on the side of the gun. The L60 was developed in neutral Sweden. Bofors, a metallurgy company, started manufacturing cannons around the 1870s. Then it was owned by the famous Alfred Nobel for a while. And after World War I, Bofors actively cooperated with the German Krupp Consortium. In March 1932, the official trials of the automatic anti-aircraft cannon L-60 were completed, and it was put on the market. In 1933, British and American military engineers studied the gun and were quite impressed. The Swedish system was more effective than the obsolete British Vickers pom-poms and had more firepower than the Chicago pianos used by the US. The maximum vertical range of Bofors was almost twice that of the British gun, and though the Swedish system had a slightly lower rate of fire than its American counterpart, the shells it used were twice as heavy. Great Britain, the USA, and 10 other countries purchased a license to produce the gun. 
and by the beginning of World War II, Bofors exported their L-60 to 18 countries on different continents. In particular, Denmark, Greece, Egypt, Siam, Australia, and Argentina. It wasn't just the Allies that used the Bofors L-60. Japanese forces captured several British guns in Singapore, and only their underdeveloped industry prevented them from mass producing them. The German Navy used L-60s captured in Poland, Norway, and France from 1939 under the designation Flak 28. They were installed on submarines and cruisers Admiral Hipper and Prince Eugen. However, the Swedish gun wasn't ideal and required modernization. The mechanical drive system on ship-based anti-aircraft mounts would break down due to its exposure to salt water and needed to be replaced with a hydraulic one. The air cooling of the barrel also had to be replaced with water cooling. Also, some design modifications were required to mass produce the gun. One of the main problems of the Bofors L60's application was a high reliance on the training and skills of the gun crew. The job of the loader is to carry or load the gun. by lifting the clip, dropping into the weapon so. Once he has done that, he then taps the gun layer on his head to let him know the gun is loaded. Loading a gun like this wasn't easy. Ammunition had to be taken out of a box and carried to the gun. As the gun constantly rotated, the carrier had to run around it with a clip of shells in his hands to pass it to the loader. This position on the gun is known as the trainer's position, and these handles are turned or reversed to allow the gun to move backwards and forwards on the target using the graticle sight in front of you. Following the tracer being fired from the gun, we can adjust for uh, aim off if we are too far in front or too far behind the target to allow uh, the other side of the gun which is the layers side, to then manufacture the elevation for the target. As time went on, the gun developed and um, so that we could come away from the, uh, the hand-driven gun, uh, she was turned into a hydraulic-driven gun, so she had uh, pressure tanks and oils and such like. Uh, which sped up the, uh, the training and the elevation of the gun uh, so that they could lock onto targets uh, quicker. This is the gun layer's position. He was also the captain of the gun and responsible for giving orders to the rest of the crew. He would, for instance, initiate the loading sequence by telling the loader to bring the gun to half cock. This means that the weapon can then be loaded with rounds into the auto feeder. He was also responsible for aiming the weapon using the 300 knot sight in front of him, using the tracers from the rounds to adjust accordingly. The command to engage or fire comes directly from the command. And without further ado, the gun captain would press the firing push. As long as he held his foot on the firing push, the gun would continue to fire as long as it had enough ammunition in the hopper to keep feeding it. The guns created a fire barrage, which was almost impossible for a single aircraft or entire squadrons to penetrate. You can see it in old newsreels. There's literally a wall of fire in the air and some plane trying to get through it. The probability of an aircraft breaking through to its target, for example an aircraft carrier or some other ship, is very, very small. 
the Bofors L-60 proved its worth during World War II. The anti-aircraft gun Bofors L-70 became its logical continuation. The human factor is crucial in Morse. A man can become frightened, maybe poorly trained, or something unexpected can happen to them. As a result, the struggle to minimize the influence of the human element and to increase the gun's survivability and rate of fire led to the development of the modernized Bofors L-70, which required minimal human input if compared to the very first Bofors gun, such as the L-60. However, the L-60 remained in use on some ships. In 1982, during the Falklands War, which involved Great Britain and Argentina, the British managed to shoot down a jet plane using this Bofors gun, even in the 1970s. When artillery was gradually replaced by missile systems, Bofors cannons remained in service. Not only the upgraded L-70s, but also the veteran L-60. It can still be found on some German minesweepers and the heavily armed US AC-130 gunships which provide fire support to ground units. Ready. They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews they are the ships that deserve to be called naval legends.